Tina Koto and welcome to this Fulbright New Zealand Good Works presentation. My name is Therese Lloyd and I'm the Senior Comms Advisor here at Fulbright New Zealand. Um, just a quick note before we begin today's session, could you please make sure that you keep your computer um, on mute throughout the discussion? Um, it's fine if you want to have your videos on, but please keep your computer muted. Um, first of all, thank you so much for joining us today. We are absolutely delighted and honoured to be hosting the extremely busy Professor Rangi Matamua, who will be sharing with us today some of his knowledge of Matariki. Um, Professor Matamua is regarded as one of the foremost Indigenous astronomers and scholars leading the revitalization, protection and dissemination of Māori astronomy and Matauranga Māori. Um, Rangi has expertise in Māori language, Māori broadcasting and Māori customs and traditions. He is a graduate of Te Pane Kire Tanga o Te Reo Māori and a member of the Society for Māori Astronomy, Research and Traditions. Um, in 2020, he was awarded, just last year, he was awarded the Prime Minister's Award for Science Communications for his work, including raising awareness about the significance of Matariki and arguably giving us a public holiday. Thank you. Um, Rangi re received a Fulbright Napai o Te Maramatanga Scholar Award um, in 2014. And in 2017, his highly anticipated book, Matariki, the Star of the Year, which we have a copy of right here, uh, was published by Huia Press. Um, thank you so much for joining us, Rangi. And please, everybody, welcome Rangi Matamui. Kia ora, tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, firstly, thank you um, very much for the welcome. And um, thank, now, I, I, but before anyone asks, um, this is Yoda. Um, now, you might not be able to see, but it's actually Yoda with a traditional Māori moko, moko on or facial tattoo and, with some, and it's done by um, a New Zealand artist. I've always had a thing for stars. Star Wars in particular, and um, um, it's just a little piece of art that kind of, I suppose it reflects um, the space I work in, which is the interface between traditional Māori knowledge and modern day science. And um, particularly um, looking at how these two uh, fields of study are not adversaries, they don't, um, knock heads with each other actually they can fit really well together as long as um, they're understood correctly from the cultural lenses from um, from from the origins of where they come from so um, yeah I always try and put on um, my um, Yoda ancestor photo there wherever I can anyway I'm going to get straight into this presentation and share with you um this presentation. Now, I'm not too sure how this is going to go. Um, it's been quite uh, uh, a busy few couple of, of weeks. Um, but I thought that what we'll do is something a little different. Um, for the past few years now, I've been doing a number of uh, lectures about Matariki, what Matariki is, where you can find Matariki, uh, how it can be uh, used and um, how our ancestors used it. I'm going to do a little bit of that um, today, um, but I don't want to spend too long on that as I want to do something a little bit different and really talk about um, time and how Matariki is this central cog that sits in the center of a uh, indigenous um, timekeeping system. Uh, a very important environmentally driven uh, division of time that um, that Māori follow. <clears throat> I need to really premise this whole presentation by saying to you, um, there are many, many ways of understanding what Matariki is um, and how it informs the new year and the Māori celebrations and time. Now, the way that I understand the system of time to work is uh, reflective and based from the community that I come from and the tribal group that I come from. There are many variations. 
Uh, some tribal groups don't even use Matariki uh, to mark the new year. They'll use other astronomical objects in the night sky um, to determine uh, when they start their celebrations. Māori people are very diverse. And um, I just want to say that um, straight off the bat that it's important <laughs> that we don't, everyone thinks this is how Māori do it. This is how Rangi does it. And this is how I would say is quite, um, many of the themes will be very similar, if not exactly the same that I talk about, but there will be variations depending upon where you are, uh, which environment you're interacting with um, and the tribal group uh, that you're with. So uh, that being said, you know, even though my name is Rangi, which means sky, uh, I don't own the sky. So there are other variations to the versions, um, uh, to, the, to the narrative that I'm going to be talking about. So, um, so Matariki, for want of a, a better, you know, off the bat is Pleiades. That's what it is. It is the star cluster that's in the night sky. That's uh, it's part of the constellation of Taurus. It sits at the uh, the face of Taurus. The uh, sorry, at the shoulder of of the bull. It's one of the earliest and most well recognised group of group of stars in the night sky. That there's a cave painting there in the top up the in the middle of the top. That's about twenty thousand years old from France. Uh, there's a star disc here uh, that's five five or so thousand years old. Um, probably the most well known narrative is the Greek um, mythology around the seven sisters and Atlas and Pelion, um, and the fact that Zeus wanted all of these uh, seven. Uh, sisters as wives and so the father said no and turned them into stars and uh, into a flock of doves actually and placed them in the sky and one of the early translations of the Pleiades means flock of doves so here they are um, and here they are sitting in the shoulder of Taurus the bull it's interesting how uh, in that 20,000 year old cave painting you can actually see the bull and just above the shoulder you see the constellation well the cluster of Pleiades and there to um, many, many years later, it's still part of the bull uh, and is still the bull in our modern uh, constellation. So Matariki is Pleiades. And here are the nine stars that make up uh, the cluster. Now, um, I know we call them the seven sisters quite often, and that's because um, they are the seven daughters of Atlas and Pelion. Uh, Atlas is the guy that holds up the world on his shoulders. Uh, hence the atlas and uh here are his children um for for maori we we my record has nine maori stars in the cluster some have seven i have nine now there is variations right across the globe um about how many stars are visible to the naked eye uh it has a lot of factors feed into your, visit, your viewing of viewing of stars, um, location, elevation. Um, generally, the more inland you are and the higher up you are, the better visibility is. Um, just your ability to view um, stars as individuals, some are better than others. Your eyes are like a muscle, and the more you use them to steer long distances, um, the better they become. And our ancestors had incredible, incredible sight. And um, there is a record of uh, six, seven, nine. I think the prophet Muhammad saw and named 12 stars in his cluster. So there is this big variation across the different cultures uh, as to the number of stars in the cluster. Now, here is a, if I can get this thing to go, here's just a little bit of a map of the Pacific. And right across um, this entire expanse of ocean, uh, Matariki, or a version of Matariki, is what we know the cluster to be. Oh, that's freezing a little bit on me. Okay, that's not going to play properly. Mm -hmm. So right across, <laughs> what that was meant to show was how right across the various islands uh, of the Pacific, um, the name of Matariki, um, or a variation of Matariki. Makali'i, uh, Matari uh, is the name that we know 
um, those uh, that cluster to be called right from Melanesia into Micronesia, right through Polynesia. And Aotearoa, the name Matariki, gets its name from the belief that um, Matariki or the god, the god Tafiri Matea, or the god of the rain and winds, or god of weather, tore his eyes out and crushed them in his hands and threw them into the sky and they stuck to the chest of his father. And Matariki is a truncated version of the name Nga Mata o Te Ariki, meaning the eyes of the god Tafiri Matea. And there they are today in the sky, uh, looking down upon us. And here is just a little bit of an artistic version. If you look in the sky, you're not going to see that. I'd be very surprised if that's what you see when you look in the sky. Um, but this is from a cultural perspective, what the stars look like from a Māori point of view. They are more than just um, points of light, giant balls of gas burning so many light years from the earth. Uh, they are actually deity and they have a connection to everything that happens on earth. So this is where Māori and quite often indigenous people um, have this amazing ability to navigate between um, empirical science and traditional and cultural beliefs. And there isn't a hiccup with the uh, crossing over of these kind of points of view. Uh, for me as an as a indigenous person, I, I actually think that those cultural elements give science flavor and they actually make it a lot easier for me to connect to the uh, knowledge base because I can see myself in what is happening in the science. Uh, so when they rise, these stars, and each of them is, has a particular spiritual or cultural connection to various scientific and ecological things that occur on the earth, I can relate to that and see that in myself, I guess. Um, and that's really helped me to understand in more detail the science of, of how this works. Okay, so here they are, the nine stars in the cluster of Matariki, according to my uh, cultural narrative and my um, tribal area, uh, you'll see in the middle, the big star is Matariki, so Māori. We have a um, interesting approach to naming stars sometimes. So we'll give Matariki the name to a star in the group, as well as the name that is attached to the group is also called Matariki. And we just do that just to try and keep everyone on their toes. But um, the star Matariki has a very important connection to um, well-being and health. Uh, she is also understood to be the conductor of the other stars in the cluster. And she guides the cluster across the night sky, um, night after night. And she has her children surrounding her. And as you can see, there are their names. Um, Three of them are male and the others are female. Um, each and every one of these stars has a very important connection uh, to the activities that occur on, on the earth. And, and I'll just go through each and every one of them. So the eldest in the uh, cluster is Paul Hutukawa. Now, Pō Hutukawa is uh, a tree that blooms in the height of summer, um, sometimes called the, the New Zealand Christmas tree. Um, in this instance, uh, Pō Hutukawa is actually associated with death and the death rituals um, that Māori uh, enact. So this star is connected to, to the people who have passed since the last rising of Matariki. So every year at the pre-dawn rise of Matariki in the morning sky, we actually um, take time out to remember those who are no longer with us and call out the names of um, the people who have died since uh, the last rising of, of Matariki in the belief that it's at that moment that our dead of the year and those who we've been mourning since their passing through the, throughout the year uh, their spirits travel into the sky and become stars 
uh, in the heavens. That's Paul Hutukawa. The next star is Tipu Anuku. Um, now, Tipu means to grow and Anuku means the ground. So this star um, in the cluster is associated to all the uh, things that grow in the ground and grow in our gardens in particular. You know, gardening was a um, mainstay of traditional Māori society. And I think there is a real misconception around the concept of um, once were warriors. I think that's still a real hangover from a uh, from a outward culture looking in and exploring what they believe Māori culture is and was. But uh, most of our time was actually spent gardening. And Tipu Anuku was the star that um, brought, I guess, the, the, the promise of new growth and the, the prosperity that lay in the soils. Uh, and, and, you know, we didn't have a winter crop. So um, we had to ensure and really work hard to, to make sure that we grew enough produce to be stored in our, um, there you have a rua, like you're looking at in the image, an underground storage pit. So we could, it would last and we'd be able to eat throughout the winter. Because if we didn't, then um, you know, we were in major trouble. Tipu Arangi means to grow in the sky. And many people will ask, well, what grows in the sky? Well, birds grow in the sky. And this, um, this star uh, has a strong association to all of the things that grow above our heads, and crew, including the fruits from the trees, but in particular, the birds. Yeah. When Māori first came to, um, to Aotearoa, uh, the major forms of protein were fish and birds. And so birding was a, a massive part of our, our activities. Uh, Wai tea, Wai is, is water. Wai tea is fresh water. And all of the rivers and the lakes and um, streams and all of the creatures that exist within those um, that part of the environment have an association with Waiti. And uh, these are lamprey. Uh, once were quite common right across the country, but they're very susceptible to water pollution. And uh, their numbers have dwindled. Um, they're a real delicacy. Uh, numbers have dwindled greatly uh, in the past 100 years to, to the point where many of the waterways where they used to live, they no longer exist. And uh, you have to go to the far regions of the South Island to see them in any kind of um, major kind of numbers. Um, but Wai tea is associated to fresh water. Wai ta, again, Wai is water and ta is salt, salt water. And this star um, has an association and connection to all of the creatures that come from the ocean. Waipunarangi means the water that pools in the sky. And it is um, the rains of the year, very important. Ururangi. Ururangi is connected to the winds. And the last star in the cluster is Hiwai Terangi. Hiwai Terangi, Hiwa means to, to grow lush, to be lush. So to be lush in the sky. And this is a star that has this really cool association to the, um, to the wishes that we hold in our, in our hearts. Very similar to, I guess, what we do a New Year's resolution today. This is the star where Māori would send their hopes and desires for the year in the hope that they will come true. And it is these collection of stars that make up Matariki. So you have Matariki, which is the star in the center of the cluster that is connected to well being. And then you have her children, her eight children that surround her. One is connected to death and one is connected to life. One is about the end, one is about the beginning, one is about, uh, I guess, the end of a cycle, and one is about the promise of new life and new growth. So that's Pohutukawa and Hiwe Terangi. The others, are associated with the major parts of our environment and every part of our environment that sustains us. So there is the earth, 
and the forest and the air. Uh, so there's the earth and the forest and everything that grows above our heads. There is fresh water and salt water. Uh, there are also the major weather indicators, which is wind and rain. And so when Matariki, and I don't know if this is my big head here, looking out, this is actually looking um, from a, um, a, a, a very steep walk um, in Ngaruwa here, just out of Hamilton, looking out uh, in the morning sky, looking towards the east. Um, here is the group of stars. I don't know if you can see my cursor on the screen, uh, but I can see it. Um, so I know what I'm, I'm looking at anyway. Anyway, this is Orion's belt. If you follow Orion's belt to the left, here is the face of the Taurus, of Taurus the bull. This is a Hades. Maori know this as uh, Te Kokota. And if you just go a little bit further, you'll see Matariki. Now, I know when Matariki rises in the correct lunar phase of the correct lunar month, just before the sun, it's the beginning of the Māori New Year. This period of time is known as the Mātahi o te tau, meaning the Māori New Year. And so uh, I really wanted to do something a little bit different. I mean, we could go on and talk in more detail about Matariki itself. But what I wanted to do really was to bring um, Matariki, uh, and this was one of the things that I really began to, to look at when I was on my own Fulbright um, journey. And uh, I just want to say a big thank you to Fulbright because um, that trip enabled me to interact with some uh, Native American um, uh, cultural astronomers and also get my brain thinking about time, in particular cultural time. And this is a really first time that I'm really going to be starting to talk about this um, and move away perhaps from just looking how Māori understood Matariki from a cultural perspective to understanding how it informed our time and what time means for Māori and what time means for all of us. Because one of the things that we have done and in New Zealand, we were actually the first to follow uh, uh, the uh, Greenwich medium time system. I think we were the first to follow England in 1868, I believe, that we uh, began following a universalized system of time that follows the precession of the earth around the sun. So our 365 and a quarter day year began to be followed uh, here in Aotearoa in uh, 18, 1868, I think it was, we're 15 years before any other country began following that system. It's really, really important to understand that because what we did at that moment is we assigned our entire nation to a system of timekeeping that has no relationship to where we live in the world, has no relationship to our environment, has no relationship to anything that happens in our oceans, in our rivers, in our streams, in our forests. We just hooked on our wagon onto someone else's horse and we've been following that for over 150 years now. And what that has done is it has severed a very, very important connection that we have to our own environment. And when you sever that bond, you sever the origins of language, the origins of cultural practice, the origins of belief, and a massive, massive part of our own scientific understanding and practice. And so what we do now is we, I knew to come on to this um, presentation because it was booked in for the 22nd of April at 2 p.m. I followed that system. I was born into that system. I know that system. Now that system has no association really to where we are uniquely in the world other than the fact that it was a system that was we decided to follow because we were a good colony of Great Britain and we started to follow it. And for Māori, that system of timekeeping has been 
in my position anyway, the greatest colonizer of culture has been time. And I just want to quickly, in the next part of this presentation, talk to you about time from a Māori perspective and talk to you about um, how Matariki informs that timekeeping system and the moves that are happening for us now to begin to reclaim our traditional kind of timekeeping systems. So this is a little, um, it is a, a kōrero. This actually uh, comes from uh, Te Toko Waru from Taranaki. Um, and he is talking about um, the year and also the appearance of Matariki. And it says, Behold Matariki, or behold Pleiades, rising upon the swell of Orion's belt, for we know Matariki measures the year during the first month of Pipiri. Now, many of you might be asking, well, what the hell does that mean? Now, what it means is that Māori used stars or heliacal stars that rise in the morning before the sun to mark the month of the year. So in this case, he is saying, Matariki rises, pushed along by Orion's belt. So here's Orion's belt, pushing Matariki up into the sky. For we know Matariki measures the year during the first month of Pipiri. Now, you follow the cursor up here. There are two stars up here. These are the two stars of Pipiri. This is an Aries. The top one itself is Pipiri. The bottom one is Uruhanui. These are the two stars that mark the lunar month. So when the, those stars are in the, in the sky before the sun rising, and you can just see the sun rising here on the horizon, it's starting to come up. Uh, Matariki's in the sky. I know that I'm in the month of Pipiti. So stars mark month for Māori. One of the very, very important markers of time is the sun. And Māori use the sun to denote season. Now, I'm not too sure if this is going to work because I was having a bit of a meltdown before. But as the sun moves in the sky, when it's in the southeast, it's summer. And it'll move back towards the northeast. And when it's towards the northeast, we know we're in winter. It's quite a... Um, it's interesting when I ask people when I'm, I'm talking about, you know, the, the, when I'm talking about the sun, I'll say, you, you guys know that, um, you know, the sun doesn't rise in the same place every year and people, uh, every, every month, every day even, and people are like, have no idea. And that's because we're not using the sun like our ancestors did to mark time. We just follow a calendar system. And we've even severed that connection to understanding when, uh, you know, the different rising and setting positions of the sun. But Māori understood that the sun rises in different places throughout the year. Okay. This is having another meltdown on me. And Māori understood that as the son who is a male who travels between his two wives. He has a winter wife and a summer wife. So he goes between Hine Takurua, who is the winter maiden, and Hine Raumati, who is the summer maiden. So he goes six months with one, six months with the other, six months with one. And I'm, I'm not condoning that uh, practice. I'm just saying what the cultural narrative is. He also had the common sense to understand that if he was going to have two wives, he better leave them in two different places. So Hine Takurua is in the sky and is personified by the star Sirius. And Hine Raumati is on the earth and is personified by the warm, rich soils that um, help everything grow in the, um, in the summertime. So Māori knew position of sun gives you major season. Uh, they also knew that the rising of particular stars give you month. So sun gives you season. Month give uh, star give you month and here we have again. This was from this year, earlier this uh, sorry earlier last year. I'm I'm thinking Maori year because Maori year runs winter to winter, not summer to summer. So this Maori year, in PPD here's PPD again. 
these two stars rising. Before the sun, Matariki was visible. I knew that we were in the first month of the Māori year. So star gives you month. And then the last factor is this one here. Lunar phase. So Māori triangulate these three factors to understand what period of time they're in. They go sun for season, star for month, lunar phase for day. And the greatest influencing factor on the day-to-day -day lives of Māori was the moon. The moon is the astronomical body that had the greatest impact upon the day-to-day -day activities of the Māori people. Really, Māori tribes, and they are, we've found about 500 different lunar calendars here in Aotearoa. That's 500 just in Aotearoa alone. That's because those lunar calendar cycles are not really lunar calendars. They're actually environmental calendars that use the lunar phases as a baseline. So they will use the lunar phase to tell them what date they're in, what day they're in. But um, there are so many other factors that feed into the timekeeping system. Um, migration of birds, spawning of fish, flowering of trees, when their birds lay their eggs, uh, when the eels migrate, uh, when uh, the cicada begins to call, when the grasshopper begins to its activities, there's all of these environmental factors. Now, I come from an inland alpine tribe. So my tribe is uh, from Te Uruwera, or the, is Tuhoi, from the heart of the Uruwera forest. Now, we have one word for fish. It's fish. Because not a lot of ocean fish come all the way into the middle of the forest. So our understanding of the oceans is very limited, as would be expected. So those activities don't have a major bearing on our environmental calendar. However, birds, flowers, and the forest have a massive impact on how we understand our timekeeping systems. And it's built into our acknowledgement of the position of sun, of the star that rises, of the lunar phase, and that will feed into when we harvest birds, when we plant our gardens, when we harvest our gardens, when eels run out of our rivers. Likewise on the coast, the position of the tides, uh, the, um, the various ocean fish spawning activities, they all feed into these different systems of time. What happens in the far north in that environment is completely different in many ways to what happens in the far south. Different species, different climate, all of these factors feed into time. Now, I'm not too sure if this is gonna play. I'm just gonna play this, so we'll see what happens. But what happens is that, sorry, I'm just telling the kids to get out. Um, what happens is, the stars rise four minutes earlier every day. So they get higher and higher and higher in the sky. Māori follow a lunar calendar system that is 354 days long. So it's shorter than a 365 day solar year. There are only 354 uh, lunar days in a lunar cycle. So it's 11 days shorter than a, a solar year. I hope this is making sense. Sometimes I confuse myself when I'm talking about this stuff. 11 days shorter. So in two years, it's 22 days shorter. In three years, it's 33 days shorter. So you miss an entire month or it slips a month across a three-year cycle. This, Sorry, this slide's not going to work for me. So what happens is Matariki this year will be high in the sky in the first lunar month of the year, which is Pipiri, which is around June, July. It'll be high in the sky. The sun will come up. 
in the correct lunar phase, we'll celebrate our Māori New Year. Next year, it's going to be a little bit lower in the sky when the sun comes up because of the slippage of days that happen every year. But that's all good because you'll still be able to view it in the correct lunar phase or the correct lunar month. Up will come the sun. We'll celebrate it. However, in the third year, it's not going to be visible in the correct lunar month because it's too close to the sun due to the 33-day slippage against the solar year. And what our ancestors would do is every three years, they would insert an extra month into the calendar system. This is an intercalary month, the practice of intercalation. Extra month into the calendar system every three years, which reset the calendar system, and you begin your three-year cycle again. Now, this is a common practice for many lunar um, calendar systems right across the world. But what is unique about how we do it here in Aotearoa is it is centered around the visibility of Matariki. So when Matariki is visible in the correct lunar phase of the correct lunar month, that is the time when we would start celebrating our Māori New Year. Sorry, that didn't work. So here we have Matariki. So I know that's the sign of the Māori New Year. This are the two stars of Pipiri, the first month of the Māori year. So this gives me month, month. The position of the sun gives me season. So season is I'm in the right season. I'm in the right lunar month. And that is actually the last quarter of this lunar month, which is the correct lunar phase or the correct day. So I know I add sun plus star plus moon. And that's how I know when to sink in my Māori lunar calendar system of time. Now, I suspect that for many of you, you might be thinking, oh, my goodness, that's really complex. It's actually not. It's not complex of, at all when you actually practice uh, this process and when you're actually enacting, interacting with your environment. One of the worst things that has happened in terms of um, of our time, traditional timekeeping systems is that we no longer rely on these um, environmental indicators to tell us when we should be doing something. We no longer sync our day-to-day -day lives and activities into our environment. And that's because we've manipulated our environment. You know, it wasn't too long ago that it was common for people here right across the world to eat season, seasonally. So you ate what the season provided. Uh, also within a Maori um, environment, um, there are times when certain animals and certain fruits are ready to be harvested. And they also fluctuate with the changing year. I showed a picture before of a native wood pigeon or a kiriru. Now, right at the moment, at this time of year, the kiriru are, uh, are becoming quite large and fat. And they are putting on good condition. And this is coming up to the time when they were harvested. So that animal is in peak condition. However, when it gets into the summer, it dives and becomes quite lean because it has eaten different fruit, eaten different um, kind of, it is eating seasonally. So it fluctuates, goes up and down, up and down. Our environment does that as well. It goes up and down. There were lean times, there were times of plenty, lean times, and it fluctuates. And all animals do that, except for us these days, because I've, I use the term flat line, but it's actually fat line, because we just eat continuously whatever we want, whenever we want, because we manipulate our environment. And what that has meant is we don't really sink ourselves in to the fluctuations, not fully, of our environment because uh, we've really learned how to manipulate our food sources and our productivity. I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but what I'm saying, it has severed this traditional connection that we have. Um, uh, for me, I think it's amazing that you know, our Māori New Year is mark taken from these markers, these actual markers in the sky that tell us when we should begin our Māori New Year. Whereas what we did do today with our new year that we're currently following, we follow it 
because it's written on the calendar. It doesn't matter what's happening in the environment. It doesn't matter what stars in the sky at that time. It doesn't matter what lunar phase we're in. It doesn't matter just because someone on the other side of the world has, has determined this is when you should practice. And so this is when we practice. And it just, I think, is another marker that reinforces how removed and estranged we are from the environment that actually sustains us. So here is a, a group of us, um, and we've been doing and have revived this practice um, for a few years now, where we whāngai te hautapu, uh, or feed the stars. Whāngai means to feed, and hautapu is with a sacred um, food source. And so um, you see in the photo here on the right, uh, we've built an altar. This is a traditional practice. Um, here is matariki in the sky. Now, what we do and what our ancestors did is they went out into the environment and they collected fruits and, and vegetables from the environment uh, and, and produce from the environment. And they actually cooked them in an earth oven and fed them to the stars. So uh, while it was still in the middle of the night, what they would do is they would gather up their food sources. They would take um, a vegetable from the gardens as an offering to uh, Tipua Nuku, or the star that um, brings the, the essence of the gardens, they would catch a, a bird and they would put that in the oven uh, for Tipua Rangi, or the star that's connected to the forest and birds. They would take an eel from fresh water and they would put that in the oven and they would take a fish from the ocean. So they would gather up the different parts of the environment and they would honour the environment and they'd cook it in the ground. And they would wait for this moment when the star was in this position correct lunar phase, just before the sun is rising in the new year. And then they would begin a series of incantations or karakia. And the first lot were to the dead of the year or Pohutukawa. And it's believed that when Pohutukawa was seen in the correct phase, that they would begin to chant and they would um, call out the names of all of the people that have died since the last rising of Matariki. And it's at that moment that they would become stars in the night sky. Um, then the other incantations would be done to say thank you to Matariki for all of the food that we have enjoyed throughout the year. This is how we say thank you back to the environment. The food's taken out of the ground. And here on this altar, you can see how we've piled the food on top of the altar and would conduct karakia or incantation to the various stars in the cluster. This is something that we've been doing for a few years now. And um, it has really been an extension of many of the Matariki activities that have been growing in Aotearoa uh, for the last 30 or so years. And then last year, this happened. Last year, the Labour government um, decided that they would be um, pushing for Matariki to become a public holiday. Um, yeah, I've been working in this space for many, many years now, and I did never, ever thought in my lifetime that this would actually be a thing. But it's actually happening. And it, the idea for a public holiday actually began some years ago. I think it might have been back in about 2008, actually, with the, with the Māori Party. Um, that actually tabled a bill, but it was not accepted. But I think there's just been this growing awareness around the importance and the uniqueness of Matariki to where we are in the world and what it means to us here. Um, so this holiday um, began to grow legs and began to, to move. And um, I'll come back to this slide. I'll go on first. A Matariki advisory committee was put forward. I just want to highlight um, these people here. So um, apart from this ugly guy looking on the end here, the rest of these people are absolute experts in their space. This is Hotudo Kerr. Hotudo Kerr and a Jack Thatcher, uh, Aotearoa's leading um, ocean-going navigators and have been involved in this um, work for many, many years. This is Rere Atamakiha, 
who is um, the country's leading, in my mind, um, leading lunar calendar expert. Uh, this is Pauline Harris, who is a Maori astrophysicist. She's actually the only person qualified on this panel to, to have a proper and scientific opinion. Uh, Victoria Campbell, who is uh, from the South Island, who is also a practitioner of Maori star law. And this is Rua Kere Hond from Taranaki, um, who is uh, an expert in Puanga, which is another star that Māori and various tribes use to mark um, the year. And so collectively, we were pulled together to uh, really set out what is going to happen for the new um, celebrations here in Aotearoa and how uh, we hope Matariki will be celebrated. So we've had to work on some dates. And what we've had to do, as you'll see here in 2022, um, Matariki sits around the 23rd of May. It's visible in the correct lunar period of the correct lunar month uh, between the 21st and the 24th. That's, it'll be in the sky before that, but that's the correct lunar phase period to view it. Uh, and the celebration period lasts from about the 21st to the 29th of, of, of June. Next year, the celebration or the day off that we're all going to have, the date, it will be the 24th of June uh, next year. So what we've done as a committee is we've tried to triangulate. Well, we have triangulated when the dates are going to happen from a lunar calendar system and then get it as close <laughs> to a Friday because they want we're Fridayizing this holiday. So we're trying to make the current Western Gregorian solar calendar system fit or fit into this lunar system of time. Now we already do it. We do it for Easter. Easter's worked out off the lunar calendar. So what we're doing is we are introducing this a holiday that will fit into our current solar calendar system, but it's actually basis has been worked out off the lunar calendar system. This is the first holiday that's been introduced since 1930. So near on hundred years. It is definitely the first Maori driven holiday in the country that is really born out of our unique and special way that we here celebrate Matariki. Now, someone told me they thought in a colonized country or a country that is, you know, being, I guess, a Commonwealth country, the first indigenous, uh, I could be making this up and I don't even know if this is true, but this is what they said. This is the first indigenous led, um, indigenous based uh, holiday in a Commonwealth country. And if that's so, that is so cool because. Matariki, and I'm pretty much going to want to end on this, Matariki is, is based around three major themes. And these themes are universal across all peoples. There's not just Maori themes. These are connected to everyone. Number one, Matariki is connected to those who are no longer with us. It is a moment where we stop and think of the people that are no longer here. Those people that have shaped us, made us who we are, and really given to us. And that's its first thing. That's why we call out the names of the dead and farewell them to say, you know, we'll never forget you. You'll always be stars above our heads. But that's its first, first role. Number two, Matariki is connected to... Um, who we are now so it's about those who are no longer here number one number two it's about celebrating the present coming together as family as friends as people um to celebrate one another all the things that we've done perhaps some of the things we wish we hadn't had done during the year um it's about feasting together uh, eating spending time with one another and the third thing it's about is about planning for the future it's about sitting down and saying, what are we going to do this year? How are we going to approach it? What are the major things that we want to accomplish? Now, around these three major themes, there are values attached to Matariki. Number one, Matariki is about unity. The saying, Matariki hunga nui, 
the gathering of all peoples during Matariki is a sign that it's about unity. Number two, it's about the environment. And it's about us giving back to the environment. One of the things as an advisory committee we're hoping to do is to embed that into the Matariki practices going forward. So during Matariki, it's not about how many presents did I get this year? It's about maybe what did what are we doing as individuals to give back to our environment? It's a period that hopefully we can do things like plant trees or clean up the coastline or, you know, take rubbish um, sitting along the riverbanks or do something that really plant, plant alongside waterways. And, you know, it's about asking ourselves, what are we doing for Waiti and Waita? What are we doing for Te Puanuku and Te Puarangi? Now, how are we giving back to our environment? So unity, environment, one of the big things Matariki is about is going home to where you are from or the place that you connect to. Going back to the people who made, who you connect to and where you're from and resting and, and letting your spirit be blown or cleansed by the winds of Tāwhiri Mātea. And we're really hoping that people understand about, you know, going back and making those connections to those places that they're from and and have made them who they are. And, and those are the major themes that uh, feed, values that feed into the themes um, that we're hoping to share with everyone and everyone share into um, during Matariki because those aren't just Māori values and themes, those are everyone's. And uh, Matariki for us is, or originates from a Māori um, knowledge base, but is actually something that we sh want to share with everyone because it's becoming part of our Aotearoa-wide, um, I guess, identity and culture. So I, I think, I think that, 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 that's, a, that's about me. This is my daughter looking out the window of, of our house. The, the windows are very dirty. Um, that's a, a telescope that she broke about three days before. And, um, and she's actually looking at a street lamp posing for a photo. The photo actually is in the middle of my book. And I was so happy, proud to have her in my book. And I said, look, honey. And she said, huh, just one page. So um, yeah very high maintenance but look i, I want to i think that's enough i think we're pretty much at the hour i just want to say thank you to fulbright thank you for the support that i've had throughout the years um and, and thank you also for the opportunity to come and, and talk sorry some of the slides weren't working um but yeah uh tēnā and i really hope that has helped you know grow a little bit of understanding around matariki and uh really hope that uh in the future all of you look to play a role in and its development and the way that it's going to influence who we are as a nation. Noreira tēnā koutou katoa.